Greetings, everybody. Hi. Thank you. Can I see a thumbs up from anybody that you can hear me okay? Great. Okay, super. Um, well, I'm, as many of you know, because we've been here before, I'm uh, Brett Walter, the um, founder and CEO of Climate Action Now, the creator of the Climate Action Now app. Thank you so much for joining us today. For starters, I have a an, a, an exciting announcement to make. Uh, I think some of you who were with me this last uh, Monday when we did an action party to help um, get a bill passed in the New York Assembly to prevent radio radiological waste from being dumped into the Hudson. Who knew that you needed a law to prevent people from doing that? Um, it had passed the Senate unanimously, but it was getting opposition uh, in the House, in the Assembly, rather. So we did an action party, and I think we set a record in that party. We sent over 3,100 messages to the New York Assembly members, and we just found out yesterday that the bill passed. And so it is now on its way uh, to Governor Hochul's desks. So that is a, I think that success illustrates the fact that public opinion is the most effective counterweight to the fossil fuel industry and other special interests. They understand the power of public opinion, which is why they spend so much time and money trying to shape it with misinformation. Our opinions are our superpower, and today we'll use our superpower to advocate for more environmentally responsible restaurant industry. So before I get going, I wanna do one more acknowledgement and thank you to Elders Climate Action uh, for co-sponsoring this event and helping us uh, promote it. And with that, I'd like to ask our Director of Content, Matthew Ballrath, to help us get started with the Climate Action Now app. So Matthew, could you bring up the Gold Tracker? Hey, everybody. Uh Seen a lot of familiar faces here, um, so I think you all, many of you know the drill, uh, but in case anybody is new to our action parties, um, what we're going to do tonight is while we listen to um, our wonderful speaker, uh, Michael Oshman and, and Marianne, um, we're also going to be taking actions. We're going to be doing something about what we're learning about. Um, and the way we're going to take action is uh, through the Climate Action Now app. Um, which you can download right now by scanning this QR code on the side. Just hold your phone up to the QR code, open your camera app, um, and just point it right at that like you're going to take a picture. But instead of taking a picture, just wait for this little yellow thing to pop up that says Climate Action Now with a little link. Um, tap on that, and it'll take you right uh, to the App Store or into the app if you already have it. Um, We've got uh, our gold tracker on the side here, ticking up the numbers in real time. Love to see that people are already taking actions. Um, so keep that up and let's get to our goal tonight and hopefully uh, to several uh, several goals. So back to you guys. Okay, well, thank you, Matthew. And uh, Matthew is going to now, we, we have this new little gizmo where Matthew can, can replace his camera with with the goal tracker. So we'll have that available to us the whole time for all of you to uh, to scan that if you need to. Um, the uh, Well, so with that, um, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's action party, Dr. Marianne Krasny, uh, Climate Action Now's Director of Food Policy, and also the Director of Civic Ecology Lab at Cornell University. So over to you, Marianne. Thank you, Brett, and thank you, Michael. Or thank you, Matthew, I should say. And thank you, Michael, also, Michael Oshman, for being here tonight as our special guest. It's my pleasure to introduce Michael Oshman, who is the founder and CEO of the Green Restaurant Association, which is a national nonprofit that was formed, I think that Michael actually formed in 1990 to create environmental sustainability in the restaurant industry. For over 31 years, Mr. Oshman has been the most vocal person on the planet regarding shifting the restaurant industry towards environmental sustainability. Michael has been featured in hundreds of media stories, including Time Magazine, NBC Nightly News, NPR, CNN, Fox News, ABC, New York Times, and many more mainstream business and trade presses. He's also had a number of interesting clients, including Harvard University, National Park Service, and Microsoft, so that's quite a range there, as well as the intercontinental hotels and resorts. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael Oshman 
and I'm very excited to learn about your green restaurant certification program. Wonderful. Can you all hear me? Yep. Okay, excellent. So, and you can see the screen okay, going forward and going backwards. Yeah, okay, excellent. Welcome everybody. Thank, thank you for making time to listen today. I really look forward to your questions. Um, Marion, thank you for the introduction and Brett for creating all of this and Matt for doing all the tech and anybody else who's uh, brought today uh, to make it happen. And thank you everybody for joining. This is a really important day. Um, <clears throat> the restaurant industry is probably the underdog of sustainability. And my job here today as the founder of this organization, I founded it when I was 19, um, about a year ago, no, about 33 years ago, um, founded the organization to green this industry. And my job here today is to really communicate to you. I'm preaching to the converted, anybody that's here today, and I spend most of my time talking to businesses and translating ethics into their language of money and PR and marketing. But I'm gonna speak my native tongue today, which is that we all care. We don't have to convince each other to care about sustainability. My job is to show you why dining out and the restaurant industry should be at the top of all of our priorities when it comes to sustainability, and it's not. And so if I'm successful, you will come away going, wow, I knew about X, Y, and Z, but I never thought about the restaurant industry as such an important piece. So um, really look forward to your questions and any future engagement. So here we go, jumping in. <clears throat> Why Dining Green should be as important to you as organic, solar, vegan, and electric car. What do you think about <clears throat> when you think about solving the climate crisis? Is it driving an electric car? Is it eating organic food? Is it going vegan? Is it going solar? I imagine it's these and maybe some other, many other issues also. But would you believe that greening the restaurant industry should actually be at the top of your green list of what needs to be done to create sustainability in this planet? Why is greening the restaurant industry so important? The restaurant industry uses one third of all electricity in the retail sector. It's actually the largest consumer of electricity in the retail sector. Americans are spending more than half of their food budget dining out. The Pacific garbage patch, if you were to dissect it, a lot of the plastic and a lot of the garbage going in there is stuff that we all purchase at restaurants. When we go to the beach, generally the number one polluter there are cigarette butts and number two is styrofoam and other food service uh, waste. <clears throat> Plastics in the ocean, we all saw a few years ago, the turtle with the straw on their nose. Um, there are, I'll, I'll, I spared you guys some of the pictures that I did at the I gave the keynote speech at the New York restaurant show a few years back. Um, but, you know, you open up an average fish and you're going to see a lot of plastic. You know, we are literally eating our plastic that's coming back to us through the food chain, which is crazy. Two thirds of the world's seafood is overfished. Fisheries are expected to collapse by 2050 if we do not start to consume sustainable seafood. <clears throat> And for every pound of shrimp, 26 that are caught, 26 pounds of other sea creatures were killed and tossed into the sea. <clears throat> By 2050, oceans are expected to contain more plastics than fish. 9 out of the top 10 items collected during coastal cleanup days are actually found at restaurants. Uh, cigarette butts, uh, plastic bottles, food wrappers, plastic bottle caps, straws and stirs, plastic bags, glass bottles, grocery bags, bottle caps, and plastic lids. So if you take out cigarette butts or grocery bags, 
You got nine out of 10 there. I don't know how many people are familiar with this, but only 8% of plastics are being recycled. After decades of working on recycling, and please don't go away from this meeting saying I'm not recycling anymore. This should compel us to recycle more. But what's really important to know is it's reduce, reuse, recycle. Recycle is the last thing right before throwing something away. And we all know that cliche. We don't live it as a society. We should be focusing on reduction and reuse when it comes to restaurants. Every restaurant you go to, when you dine in, should have reusables, not disposables. If it took us 40 years to get to 8%, 8 it could take us another 40 years to get to 6, 16%. We don't have that time. China and Malaysia have banned imports of our plastic waste. And the environmental impacts on the levels of meat consumption, our organization does, deals with every aspect of sustainability from energy, water, waste, disposables, chemicals, food, and building. <clears throat> Raising animals for food uses 45% of the Earth's total land. 55% of water consumed in the US is for animal agriculture, and one to two acres of rainforest are cleared every second. In the US, 60% of corn goes to feed livestock, and 18% of the world's carbon emissions are accounted for in this industry. <clears throat> the impact of food, that's just the production. What about just food waste unto itself? 2.6% of all US greenhouse gas emissions annually, all are just from food waste. 21% of the US agricultural water usage goes to food waste. 21% of the US landfill content, 19% of all US crop lands are feeding nobody and just being wasted and almost a quarter trillion dollars. If it were a country, the worldwide food system would be the largest, the largest producer of greenhouse gas emissions in the world. That's the food system. That's both restaurant and also grocery. If the American restaurant industry was its own country, it would be the 17th largest country on the planet. That statistic is plus or minus a few, um, depending upon if you're looking at CO2 emissions or gross domestic product. But essentially, the upcoming um, climate conference, you know, there should really be the 200 plus restaurants, and then there should be, excuse me, 200 plus countries from the UN, and there should be the restaurant industry somewhere at number 17 in terms of its impact. It's larger than, you know, 185 countries or so. The average restaurant produces 100,000 pounds of trash a year. And the average restaurant uses about 1,500 gallons of water um, actually each day. That is a typo, excuse me. This totals over 2 million gallons of water each year. What does it mean to green the restaurant industry? <clears throat> it's the a singular mission of our nonprofit organization. How do we green a restaurant? We do an environmental assessment to give restaurants a baseline in relationship to their energy use, water, disposables, and other categories I mentioned. We then work with the restaurants and their vendors to implement real change. This is not about commitments. It's not about pledges. It's not about a nice press release. Um, it's about real change that's actually verified against real standards. And once they make the changes, we verify all the steps in a transparent way so that customers, if they're going to bother dining in a certified green restaurant, it's real. Just like if you bother getting an organic apple, you want it to be real. If you bother getting an electric car, you don't want to open it up and see a combustion engine. Um, and then we educate restaurants and consumers on the environmental issues. So I won't go too much into organization. You go to dinegreen.com, find out more. Um, but it's all about transparency and making real changes. And then we communicate which restaurants meet our standards, one of our four certified green restaurant levels. We have level one, two star, three star, four star. We also have badges like near zero waste badges. We have the largest database of green solutions for the restaurant industry. We've been helping restaurants go green longer than any organization on the planet. We founded this movement. We've been doing it for 33 years. And here are some of the restaurants that we've certified. You might recognize some of them. 
Congress, the cafeteria there, the Statue of Liberty, the Super Bowl and MetLife Stadium, American Express, Morgan Stanley, small college named Harvard, Princeton. We're in 47 states in Canada. And, um, you know, we are, we, I could talk a lot, but we want to get right to the action. So what can you do? The average millennial eats out five times per week. In 2022, Americans spent 20% more on dining out than on groceries. And this has only gone up during um, the pandemic, before the pandemic, and it's continued. By taking the following steps, you can have a significant impact on creating a more environmentally sustainable world. When you dine out, um, one of the best things you could do is find a certified green restaurant on dinegreen.com. And when you get there, and I don't say this to most people, but if you're in this call, you're an activist, you care, you're ready to do action. So I could say this to you, thank the restaurant. We take for granted the good guys, right? It's so what, what, what's human nature is to complain is to look at who's not doing things right. But if we invest and we actually give positive feedback to those who are already doing the right, whether it's in the restaurant industry or other, or other industries, it actually creates a gravitation in that direction and keeps those businesses doing the right thing. Um, you know, as, as mature as the sustainability movement has become, it's still under 10. I would say it's under five in terms of the maturity of where we need to be, meaning you could have a restaurant that goes green, but they don't see good business for it. They could be out of the loop for the next five years and stop. So thank the restaurant manager or owner when you do go to a certified restaurant or when you go to any place that's doing the right thing. So Michael, I'm sorry. I just want to jump in. Sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to, I should have warned you in advance. I was going to interrupt you when we hit our goal, which we did. Uh, we hit our goal of 800. Um, wow. So this is an active group right here. And, and just for those of you who haven't caught up yet, essentially what we're doing with the actions is we're sending messages, letters to the CEOs of major restaurants, mostly chains, asking them to get certified. Um, and I think it's, it's important to understand we're not asking them to recycle more. You know, we're not asking them to compost more. We're not saying to them, you should do more because what they'll do is they'll just reply saying, we're already doing these things. So the whole idea of certification is in order for them to get certified, and I, I would be interested, Michael, if you have time to get into some more of the specifics of the specific of the certifications, you know, that you, you yeah. offer. But, but the whole idea of the certification is that they're certified or they're not, right? And, and they have to do a suite of things and keep doing it in order to maintain the certification. So this is how we get them on the hook and keep them on the hook, not give them a way to greenwash their way out of accountability. So just, sorry, sorry for my editorial comments, my, Michael, but no, I learned that from you, by the way. So yeah, no, it's, it's, I'm glad it's, it's perfect timing that you're bringing that up. I'm glad we hit the goal. Hopefully uh, people will continue and we'll exceed it. Um, but it's very important what you're saying. Brett and I had conversations of what's the ask. And, um, you know, when a restaurant's certified, it's a long, it, it, they're signing a contract. Um, they are legally, um, often we have uh, confidentiality agreements. We can look at their invoices. I mean, you know, I talked about this with Brett, there's a particular chain and I'm not gonna name their name. They might be on this list though. Um, and, uh, they tout themselves as having sustainable food, but it's not transparent. It's a marketing claim. And they very well might be doing it. And it might be legitimate. And it might be somewhat legitimate, it might not be legitimate at all. It's hard to know. And so when a business is just making claims, they are just claims. When they are certified by a body like ours for the restaurant industry or other certifications for other other industries, it's something the consumer can trust. 
And if they then develop good business patterns out of that, they go from level one to two star to three star to four star. So there's a real strong value, Brett, as, as you said, of not just making a particular, if you say go solar, they'll tell you there are three restaurants that are already solar out of their thousand. If they, if you talk about recycling, they'll talk about the recycling, but what they won't tell you is they don't have a comprehensive recycling and composting program that's consistent. You know, there's a very, very, very large chain that you probably all went to in the past week or two, and maybe you went a few times, who's been trying to deal with their waste and what their disposables are made out of. And I've been part of these conversations. I've been to their corporate headquarters. Um, and at some point they were considering working on, uh, with us and they decided, you know, we're gonna do it ourselves. We're gonna certify ourselves. I said, you can't do that. You know, you can't, that doesn't mean anything to the public. What standards are you certifying yourself against? Ones you make? And who's certifying? Who's the outside body that's doing that? And it becomes meaningless. And I've seen this company who very well probably has good intentions. Um, they've taken decades to barely move the mark on goals they had 20 years ago. And they have the financial resources to probably achieve those goals in six months or a year. So that's where certification plays, is that when there's a competition, and we've seen this, we have a bunch of caterers in DC, everybody who wants to cater, all the politics there seems to need to be a certified green restaurant now. There became competition, or in universities, there became competition for certification. Now it's in airports. So once there's a competition and your competitor is doing it, then you have to do it. And you have to do it the real way of becoming certified. And at that point, you see the value of getting the support of our organization, doing it transparently and not kicking the can another 10 years. So I encourage, here are different ways to encourage your favorite restaurants to become certified. Um, one easy way is send them a direct message on social media or comment. We're doing it today via email, um, but go on your favorite chain. It could be part of the list that we have or some other list and uh, send them a direct message. I want you to become a certified green restaurant by the Green Restaurant Association. You could even specify I want you to be a two-star, three-star, four-star. I want you to meet the zero near zero waste batch, whatever it is that's interesting to you, but just any specific request really... Um, I've seen it uh, have a big impact. You could send them an email as we're doing today um, and you could call them. How many consumers call their favorite restaurant, especially today when, you know, um, most people don't call, they email, they do they, uh, text. So calling leaves a very big impression because most people don't call. And most of them have customer service numbers. When you dine out, speak to the manager. The other one was thanking them if they're certified. This is if they're not, talk to the manager. When's the last time, you know, when somebody dines out, even people who are um, concerned about the environment, they generally don't speak up. When I used to give a lot of in-person presentations to consumer fairs, I would ask people, when you go out to eat, to put your hat on saying, um, I love the environment. Do you wear your t-shirt saying, I'm a tree hugger? Do you, you know, put, wear a pin saying, please compost? Most people don't. They're going out to eat. They're there to have a good time. They're not there to be an activist at that moment. But for the few people that actually do say something to the manager, because it's so few people making any comments, it actually has a huge impact. You're not one of a thousand people that day that walked into that chain. You probably are the only one who made a comment on this issue and therefore it makes an impact. Um, another easy thing to do to lower your impact when dining out to eat is just finding something that's walkable, public transportation. Um, and then when you get to the restaurant, whether it's a certified green restaurant or if there's not one near you, um, you could choose menu items that are low on the food chain. You, if you eat fish, you could choose go to various different apps, as you probably already know, to choose the, the sustainable seafood. So even at a restaurant that isn't so sustainable, there's things that you could do to be in line with your own ethics. Now, obviously that doesn't move the mark in a big way of creating a demand for that restaurant, but while you're talking to the manager and you're already there, there are ways even at a steakhouse to, uh, 
to have lower your impact. Um, and then for all the people that are not on this call, you can encourage people who aren't here today to spread the word. Here's our contact information. I'm happy to share the presentation with anybody. Um, but we have internships. Uh, we are a growing organization, constantly looking for great people. So is anybody out there that uh, is looking for this kind of work, you could send your information over. Um, and we are literally an organization that wants to not exist 10 years from now. These are issues that are solvable, right? At some point, Kennedy said, let's put a, a man on the moon, and we did. There are certain diseases that plagued humanity that are 99.9% not here anymore. We have a um, propensity uh, with our, our, our short-sightedness to see these issues as ever-present, but they don't have to be. Um, they are solvable. We can get to a place where our energy is clean. We can get to a place where we are not throwing massive amounts of things out. We didn't do that 40 years ago or 50 years ago. That's all relatively new. The problems on their scale and many of them just, the problems themselves are relatively new. And just as they came, they could also go. So we're an organization that's, that wants to, and I know every organization does, but sometimes movements get stuck inside of themselves. And I just really want to remind all of us here that uh, there will be a day where energy is clean. There will be a day where unsafe chemicals are, aren't necessary. They're not necessary now, but they won't be. Um, and there'll be a day when the idea of throwing things in the garbage is just reprehensible and there's systemic um, tools to make it so we can really operate in the proper way. And that's the purpose of organization is to carve out the small niche called the restaurant industry, which isn't so small when you consider it should be 17 or 18 at the UN. Um, and we really encourage you individually or with the organization to really consider how often do you buy a car? When you do, go buy that electric one if you can. Um, how often do you buy a house? If you do, try to put solar on there. But these are decisions that are rare. And when you make it, it's generally a one-time decision, or maybe you'll buy the next car in 10 years or next house in 20 years. But these are not common decisions, but how often do you go out to eat? Once a week, twice a week, twice a day, seven times a week? For many people, it's very often. And therefore, you can make hundreds, if not thousands of decisions over the next year or two and those thousands of decisions of where you go, what you say, make a big impact. Because when you go out to eat for an event or with your family or your friends and you say, we're going to a certified green restaurant, you'll get five other people saying, what is that? And some of those people will join, join this movement. And the nice thing is solar is expensive, getting an electric car is expensive. Um, they're big decisions. Buying a house is a big decision. Going out to eat is not. You're going out for pizza, go to a place with a lower impact. It is such a small ask for the average consumer, and it really transcends politics. This is, we're not asking somebody to sign on to a bill where you're only going to get the left and the center. Um, this is apolitical. Go, let's go out to eat and produce less garbage and use less energy and um, you know, you want a steak? Okay, fine. You have a steak. I'm going to have this. Um, this person has sustainable seafood. There, it's, there's, this is not about making every restaurant vegan. Uh, it's just not going to happen. It's about shifting the real restaurants out there in the right direction as fast as possible. So with that, I will uh, put a bookmark there. Happy to hear people's questions. I'll just jump in right now. We're um, up to 1,077. I think you can awesome probably- Awesome job, awesome job. You can scan that QR code. Uh, but just in case, Matthew, would you uh, put up- Yeah, the because the uh, screen is pretty big right now. So um, I might wanna steal it back from Michael for just a moment here, put this back up. And while, while uh, Matthew's doing that, 
I'd I like to just make an editorial comment about one of the things uh, Michael said about going into the restaurant and, and speaking, you know, to the manager or even, you know, the, the service people. Um, and he was saying, well, maybe they have a thousand people, only one person speaks up. I can tell you as a business owner uh, through most of my career, every business owner knows that if they hear from one customer about something, there's a hundred who are thinking the same thing, but don't bother to speak up. And so to Michael's point, you know, the few people who do speak up actually speak with a louder voice and a louder me megaphone uh, than people who don't, because because the business people know that this is how how most consumers are, that they're afraid or shy to speak up. I'm not shy anymore, folks. I do it. And I, you know, what I'll do is I'll say, you know, I'd like to see more vegan options, you know, on the menu. Just if they just add one entree, you know, that, that you know, and they have 20 entrees and one of them is is vegan. That's a big deal. I mean, that's 5%, right? That, that That's going to impact. So anyway, I'll, I'll get off my high horse. And um, and, and over to you, Marianne. I, I, I noticed we've had some really excellent questions in the chat. Uh, yeah, and I just lost my file <laughs> that had the questions in it. Um, so, but I, but, so I'll just look at the chat till I can recover that. So, um, just a second here. Well, Frances, I remember Frances's question. Frances Stewart, she's in the Washington, she's in Bethesda, the DC area, and, um, a real mover and shaker down there with the Maryland, Maryland legislature and with Elders Climate Action. And, she says she doesn't eat at chain restaurants. Um, she'd like to influence some of the restaurants that she goes to. And I know you talk, touched on this, Michael, about how you can influence, you know, talk to the manager, but maybe a few more tips on what works and what doesn't work if you really want to talk to somebody. Because you can imagine going yeah. in there, they're super busy, they don't want to talk to you. Do you go in at special times, for example? No, I would say that the best place to go to is the place you already are going to. You know, we all have those places that we've been going to for years, you know, um, depending upon if you're new to the neighborhood, some people have lived in the same place for years, go to the place where you already know the manager, have that be the first place. That person knows you, they know you're a valuable customer, they know you've been coming in for 20 years, or five or two or whatever it is. So that's what I would recommend is first go with the easiest ones. Um, and then for those who don't have that kind of relationship with a restaurant, um, speak to the manager and just be nice. Be nice. Don't, don't be the angry environmentalist that will turn them up. Just be I, I Wow, I come here about once a week. I come here with some of my coworkers. I love your tacos. I love your salad. I love the ambiance. This is one of my favorite places. And sustainability is so important to me. And it's really become increasingly important to me at, at restaurants, the supermarket, to make decisions that are in line with my values. Mm -hmm. And so I really want to come in here for years to come. I love it here. And I'm just letting you know that this is increasingly becoming a decision where I'm starting to look for certified green restaurants of how I make my restaurant decisions. And I'd, I'd love for you to, um, to consider becoming a certified green restaurant, becoming more sustainable, and contact an organization that does that um, because over the coming time, myself and a lot of people are relying on organizations because we don't know what's going on in a restaurant. I can't go into a supermarket and ask the person, well, how's this apple grow? Well, it uses this chemical, but not this one. It's biodynamic. And then nobody has, most people don't have the knowledge or the time. So I'm really looking for the easy ways to identify which businesses are green when it comes to restaurants, it's the certification. Um, and uh, just would love for you to consider. It'd mean a lot to me uh, in terms of how I feel about the restaurant. Something like that. Mostly positive. But what you're also saying is, I'm not going to boycott you today. You're not saying that. But you are implying, over time, I'm giving this more and more weight. I'm giving more and more of my business to these kind of places. So any smart manager is going to put two and two together and say, wait, I better get ahead of that. Otherwise I can start losing loyal customers like Marianne. Mm -hmm. Or Francis. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, Francis did have a follow-up question there, and that is, is it financially viable for small restaurants to become certified? Yeah, I mean, we do have, I, I mentioned the Super Bowl and all those exciting ones. I didn't mention Bob's Pizza Restaurant because it's not as exciting in a PowerPoint presentation, but yes, we have had, you know, we started with small restaurants. We we have a lot of small restaurants out there. It's not only viable, but um, often when I'm on a panel in front of restaurants, they say, is it more expensive to become green? I've been asked that question for 30 years. And I say, it's actually more expensive to not become green. Mm -hmm. And the way that works is you have your restaurant continuing to do business as usual and your competitor becomes a certified green restaurant. They now have the world experts in creating a more sustainable business, a more efficient business. They're gonna have lower water bills while your water bills stay the same. They're gonna have lower energy bills. They're possibly gonna start saving hundreds if not thousands on their waste bills by diverting to composting or just by putting less in there to begin with. We have restaurants that can save thousands of dollars. Just one study that we did during the pandemic or um, that we actually picked up on, we didn't do the, the raw um, research, um, but about $5,000 can be saved by a restaurant by having opt-in for utensils, for um, ketchup, mustard, napkins, all of those things that go into the bag when you're just going home and you, you can eat it with your fork. You don't, you know, you can, you don't need the fork at that time. You don't need the ketchup. You don't want to open up 10 little ketchups for your French fries. It's annoying. When you have to, you do it, but you might go home and use your own ketchup and that's going to be wasted. So this, there's thousands of dollars just there for opt-in. Mm -hmm. So, and then you throw in employees, 78% of employees prefer working at certified green restaurants and 79% of consumers prefer dining at them. Take your average 20 year old, 22 year old who's working at a restaurant, you ask them, would you rather work at a restaurant that is a certified green restaurant that's committed doing this in a transparent way? Or would you rather a business who's doing business as usual and three quarters will say one and a quarter will say the other. Um, so it's good for business also in terms of retaining employees. And we've gotten real data from a restaurant showing the quality of people applying to a restaurant that's certified is higher. You get people not only who are good at what they do, but they actually care. And that's the kind of employee you want. So I would say it's not just feasible. I'd say it's, it's not really sustainable from a business perspective to not have this be front and center anymore. Okay, thank you. And um, Helen Archer Dust, similar question, what is the cost for the initial certification? Yeah, so the price, it varies, as you could imagine, a stadium and a university are gonna be more expensive than a small mom and pop. Mm -hmm. But for an average restaurant who grosses under a million, which is a year, which is what an average restaurant does, around six or 700,000, um, they can come on board for around, I think it's uh, around $55, $60 a month. It's like a cell phone bill. Um, and they could all, you know, it depends if they pay in full, they could do monthly. But for many of our restaurants, that's the pricing. And that comes with everything. They get, we do an environmental assessment. We work with their waste haulers. We come up with the solutions. We do the verification. They get certified. They get a, a, a marketing person to create press releases and social media and posters and digital and social, all of that. So for most restaurants, it's not only the cost is inexpensive, but the likelihood of them making back that $60 or so a month is quite great, if not much more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, yeah. Matthew, Judy had a question in there. I don't know if you see it, Judy Zinger from New York. She says that the campaign indicated 100 letters, but thank you, Judy, you already finished after 80. Good uh, for you, Judy. All right, um, let me just check real quick. I think it may have, we may have not quite synced. Okay, it does look like 80 is what we have for today. Uh, I think we might have missed a, Missed a sink at the very end here, but um, there'll be more in the coming days. Uh, but 80 is what we've got for now. Good question. Okay. Thank you, Judy. Um, and then back to Helen Archer Dust. 
How does the certification process relate to local ordinances for sustainability? It's a great question. I'm glad somebody asked that. So one of the, you know, one of the positive impacts of, of our organization's work over 33 years is we go into a community, we work with XYZ restaurants who are the ones who come on board. We have to work with their distributors and their waste haulers. So now the distributor needs to meet this new need of the restaurant to have that 90% post-consumer recycle napkin or that green chemical or that more sustainable food because they really want to take care of that very important client, whether it's an airport or a Harvard or a small mom and pop. Then that distributor has all those products. Now they want to sell them to all the non-certified green restaurants. So there's a huge ripple effect if we just get a handful of restaurants to create a, a real demand, not through a campaign, but just through commerce. We, we make an impact there. We also have made an impact in the legislative world, although we haven't spent our time um, doing a lot of legislation. What we've done is created facts on the ground. So when some big states want to create composting mandates, they contact us and they ask, uh, this is what we're thinking of doing. This is the legislation. And we've sometimes reviewed some of that legislation. Um, and we're on, in, in some states, we're actually on some panels um, that help that. And we get to say, uh, you can hear a thousand restaurants. Let us tell you as the organization is doing this, there's no reason why every restaurant can't compost. You know, as long as you get, you might need some sort of waiver for that place that literally has no room, but as long as your legislation has waivers, literally can't, um, we can capture 90, 95%, 99% with your legislation. We work with some state senators or Congress people from Florida regarding a reuse bill. So we serve as the experts that show these are the restaurants that did it not because they had to. These are the restaurants that did it through a voluntary program like ours. Use them and use our experience as a guinea pig to show that this is all doable, good for business, doesn't, you know, nobody can lobby you to say it's going to put them out of business because we have facts on the ground showing the opposite and how it's beneficial. And as a result of that, there's a proliferation. We have something on our website called legislation. You could see some of it. It's not so updated. It's a small, small drop in the bucket. Um, our new, our next newsletter, I encourage people to go to dinegreen.com, go to our social, go to our, um, subscribe to our newsletter. Our next one's going to come out in a couple of weeks. Um, and we're going to do one on new legislation of uh, something going on on the West Coast. It's, it's, it's happening like this. It is incredible. The styrofoam bans, the recycling mandates, the composting mandates, and what's happening now, which is really exciting, is some shifts shift towards reusables, um, which is really what we want to get to. So that's still in its infancy. Um, but the legislative environment is fantastic. And it's happening mostly on the city level, some on the state level. So I'm going to thank you, Michael. I'm going to butt in because I think this question is my own question, but it kind of follows you. you from what you've been talking about, you've talked a lot about composting and, you know, uh, I think more and more cities are going to curbside pickup, which could include restaurant pickup. I know my city of Ithaca is. Um, so, but at, just like, you know, reuse is better than recycle, uh, reuse food or food donation programs are better than composting, right? It's higher up there on the effectiveness One, scale. 100%. So, donations? in my experience, like trying to work with students to say donate food from fraternities or dining halls to our local food donation organization, nonprofit, is really difficult because of state laws about, you know, even like in a fraternity, like the cooks cook more food than they, the boys, the guys need because it's cheaper to buy in bulk. But if they've just taken one serving out of a tray, they can't donate it even though it's the chef that took the serving out, not the not the residents. So yeah. is there any work going on on, are you involved in food donation programs and trying to streamline the process? So we that is one of the steps for which we give credit, um, green points, and we encourage all of our restaurants to do that. In our new near zero waste badge, that's actually a requirement is to have uh, regular donations to some sort of food bank. 
Um, there's some interesting apps that you guys might have seen that basically at the end of the day, those $6 muffins are $2 if you come at four o'clock and mm -hmm. people looking for deals go there. So that's that's a great example of using technology and, and market demand. So um, there is movement in that direction. You know, un unfortunately, um, it's, it's the things that are hard logistically are the things that the restaurants, you know, running a restaurant is already so hard logistically. So I think we're going to need some market-based solutions like that app to really create an incentive where they can monetize that waste. You know, mm -hmm. now it's worth it. Instead of me throwing it away, I'm at least going to recoup the cost of that food by selling it for 2 or $3. As we figure out more solutions like that, um, mm -hmm. which which um, you know that could be helpful. There, there, I would I wouldn't be surprised if there become laws at some point. I wouldn't expect them around the corner, but in five years, once we figure out recycling, composting, um, to really have states look at that next level, which is um, you know how do we how do we get them to human beings who need them first? So. It is a complicated one. Um, as you know, there's the Good Samaritan law, which was you know, a couple of decades ago, I think during uh, Clinton's presidency, but even with it, people are hesitant and there are, as you said, lots of, lots of uh, details there. But in a restaurant, there's many things that haven't been touched. You know, yeah. Maybe a franchise is different or an event, but um, you know, there's a lot of food that maybe can't be served at that shishi restaurant anymore, the salad. I'm not serving it, but I'll give it to the food banks. It's still safe. So there are things that are easier logistically that are that are safe to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might be interesting to look at institutions like universities or schools in addition to restaurants. I mean, I know you're already working with food service organizations in terms of this because um, yeah. they're 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 maybe not as profit driven, not operating as much on a shoestring possibly. But anyways, I just wanted yeah. to mention too good to go. I don't know if that the app that you're thinking of as well as Olio, but I think Olio is not restaurant based. It's um, anyways, I'll put them in the chat. I don't wanna take up too much of your time because there's some other questions. So um, is there possible, Susan Lewitt, she's from San Diego. She asks, is it possible to get a list of green certified restaurants? Is that on your website? It's on our website. And Susan, we started in San Diego. Um, we started in La Jolla in downtown San Diego. Uh, I was actually a student at UCSD there. So we spent many, many years developing the program there until with the help of the internet at the end of the 90s, that started spreading around the country. So once upon a time, we had a paper newsletter, 100% post-consumer waste recycled paper that was delivered to the Ocean Beach Co-op, to UCSD, to every place, about 10,000 of them. Um, thankfully, we've been on the internet the past couple of decades. And so, yeah, you could just do a search for San Diego on dinegreen.com. Okay, great. Oh yeah, some Matthew posted the searchable list. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I'm a little confused about Annette's question, but I'll maybe you'll get it. So she asked, does Dying Green and then parentheses SRA know about Mill, which does distributed food ground recycling? They are working with whole cities. Maybe they'd work with restaurants. Is this an organization you're familiar with? It's called Mill. That's what. It says there, and that I don't know if you want to add something. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not familiar with an organization called Mill. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah, Ned, if you want to maybe um, explain that further in the chat, that might be helpful. Um, and Francis just made has a suggestion here. It would be helpful to be able to search by state or by zip. Yes. Yes, we are. Something we need to do. That's our goal for the coming year. And Judy points out that Moosewood in Ithaca is not certified. Boo hoo. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. You know, some of the early players like uh, like Moosewood. Um, you know, when we began, often the ones who were like vegetarian, which often at that time back in the '90s was all that they were doing. Um, which is great, but you know, one of hundreds of steps that can be done. There, there is this um, feeling from some restaurants that develop some green cred on their own that we don't need to be certified. Mm -hmm. And our argument to the vegan restaurant or the Whole Foods restaurant 
is one, you know, we come into those restaurants, they're not at the top of our list. Mm -hmm. They're going to, they're going to rack up some good points, Mm -hmm. but there are hundreds of things that they haven't thought of. Why? Because they're really into the vegetarian side, but they might not be as familiar with zero waste or green cleaning or sanitizing or green building or green furniture, et cetera. And the proof is in the pudding because when we actually do work with those restaurants, they might come on board at a level one or two, but they're paling in comparison to the greenest restaurant we have that has two or three times more points. So we encourage those restaurants to one, get certified because we're gonna help you go much further. And two, if you do authentically care about this, you becoming certified helps create a demand for other restaurants. That you doing it on your own is wonderful. You doing it as part of a larger system creates many fold the demand um, for these kind of things. So, and thankfully we, we've, we've had some restaurants that were hesitant who then um, come on board and really see the wisdom of not just trying to influence on their own, but being part of a larger group of restaurants that are creating a larger demand. I, Mike, I'd like to jump in for a second and just point out that Annette did put a link to mill.com. So if, and if you want to find out more about it, that's how you can do it. I also wanted to just make a comment for everybody here. I think you all know that our bias at Climate Action Now is for systemic action. Uh, there's plenty of apps that are concerned with helping you capture your carbon footprint and make lifestyle changes, and that's great. But um, our perspective is we really want, there's not enough systemic action. And, and I would encourage all of you to consider that when you send these messages to the restaurant CEOs, or when you go into your favorite restaurant and ask the owner or the manager to get certified, that is a form of systemic action. And that's sort of what Michael's saying, because then if the food, if the distributor who serves that restaurant then has to make some special provision for that restaurant or to keep them happy, well, they've now built that into their system and it's available to other restaurants or the, their competitive restaurants who aren't certified. Well, now they have a, now they have pressure. I mean, this is a, this is a trigger point. Uh, so this is something that all of us can do that will ripple, you know, through the food system if we really just speak up. And I, and I think that the, the only, I mean, I just know, someone just noted there's only like four restaurants in San Diego that are green certified. Why is that? I'll let Michael answer. My guess is going to be there hasn't been push from customers to do it. And it, the, the only thing that's going to make most restaurants do anything is either uh, regulations uh, by, their, by the cities or, or laws or customer demand. Uh, but they're so busy, you know, th- their margins are pretty thin. I think most restaurants, so they're just not looking for more work. The only way they're going to do it is if all of us, you know, step up, advocate, advocate for sustainability laws, but also apply customer pressure, uh, you know, to restaurants to do something about this. This is our, this is our power as, as, as activists is our opinions really, really make a big difference. So Michael, do you want to answer the question? Why yeah. are there more restaurants? Yeah, no, especially and that's the city where we started. Um, I think there might be more four, more than four because we don't have a state search. There's other, you know, there's uh, smaller regions in the San Diego County that might be in there. For example, Del Mar is a different city. Um, but, you know, even if it's more than four, it's not hundreds at this point. And there's two things that need to happen. One, we just as an organization need to up our own outreach. Uh, We have one person organization that does outreach and we have a million restaurants in the country. So just, we need to scale up. We do a fantastic job on the environmental side. We just need to scale up our sales and marketing side, which um, thankfully we have the ability to do this year and we'll be doing that. And the other thing is to do creative things like this, Brett, where we are um, getting the best salespeople in the world, which is people who really care, who are much more credible than, you know, my uh, business development uh, development person calling or myself. So we need to really go back to our roots, which is why I'm excited about this, and uh, get back to consumers and really empower consumers. And in terms of the ripple effect, I'll tell you two inspiring stories. 
One is not only do we affect the distributors, we go into a mall. And if that mall doesn't have recycling or composting, then we for free will then help that mall set up recycling or composting because we have to, because that one restaurant's our client. And the only way to service our client is to develop an ecosystem, if you will, in their mall that has recycling or composting. So meanwhile, we helped that one restaurant, but we also helped the 30 others that are not certified start doing that. The other thing of the ripple effect is we recently got a company on board who is JFK, um, Newark, and um, LaGuardia airports. And um, those are significant airports, as you can imagine, most of us have been to those. Um, and because they took a lot of leadership, another company um, just told us they want to bring in all their locations in scores of airports across the country. Now, it's pretty clear they're doing it because somebody had done that before then. And that is the argument for certification. Had those airports just done a few sustainability things on their own, it wouldn't have been this big announcement of we're certified and the other airports wouldn't have copycatted as much. So that's the uh, that's some of the power of consumers being able to influence. And then those businesses who make the change then start knocking down some more dominoes. So we'll get to San Diego. We're going to get more restaurants there with your help. So I, I uh, Marianne, I'm going to jump in because we just have two minutes left in the hour. And I have one important announcement I'd like to make. But first, uh, maybe a more important announcement is, is Hey, folks, we beat our goal. We sent 13,000, well, 1,337 letters to CEOs. They would not have received had we not had this event and had not all of you in, or many of you been, you know, attending and using your app and so on. So well done, those, well done. those actions are still, they are in the app now permanently. Uh, you can find them when you're in your action carousel, go to the upper right corner and select campaigns and then look for a campaign called dying green and if you didn't have time to do it today you can go back and start that campaign and, you know and take those actions so that number i guarantee you if a week from now two weeks from now it's going to be three thousand four thousand messages that will have been sent speaking of action parties and and, and so thank all of you for participating and for taking action systemic action on the food restaurant industry Thank you, Michael, for the incredible work you've done since you were 19 years old. I don't think of anything I started at 19 that I'm still doing. So you are in a league of your own, pretty much. And thank you for that and making the time to come and meet with us and Mary Ann for so graciously moderating this. One final announcement. Um, we, are, um, we are doing a, a third action party on the farm bill on June uh, 13th. I just July. put that July. July thank you. Thank you, Maria. July 13th. Um, and uh, folks, this is super important. Um, the Farm Bill is our last big opportunity to do significant climate law at the federal level for the foreseeable future. And by that, I mean, we can't foresee what the next Congress is going to be. We can't foresee what the next president is going to be. But if it's not you know who, we're not going to get any climate legislation. So this is it. This is a huge bill, hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. This is our last big opportunity to move, move the needle. So please be there. That event, National Party, is co-sponsored by Earth Justice, uh, National Resource Defense Council, and the Environmental Working Group, uh, and also Climate Reality. I know a lot of you folks are Climate Reality folks. So please be there, get on your calendar now, July 13th, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, we also don't, we, we have scheduled, but we haven't posted the event yet. We're going to have a food waste uh, action party. What was the date for that? That was the following week, Marianne, do you remember the date? Um, they're looking at July 19th. They, they want to know if you're available that date, Brett. Oh, okay. Look now, at your I, email. I will be. Uh, yeah, so that's a food waste, and with some of the heavy hitters in the in the food, another again another panel uh, with some experts in food waste, and so we'll have you know lots of 50, 100 or more actions messages queued up for you to send you know from the app to advocate for 
a much more saner approach to to food. Um, so with